because that's the reason we're here, amen? Lord Jesus, we love you, God, and we just proclaim, Lord, that you are great and greatly to be praised. And Lord God, tonight we are here, Lord, to just lift you up and to give you all praise and glory, Lord, because you are worthy, Lord. Just meet us here, God, in your precious name, amen. The greatest day in history, death is beaten, you have rescued me. Sing it out, Jesus is alive.
tonight we give you praise we give you glory and we give you honor you are the king above all kings that sits on the throne that is higher and greater and stronger and more powerful than any throne that we can imagine here on earth God you are greater than any God that people lift up on this earth Lord there is none like you and tonight we take just a few more moments to love on you in your own words just begin to love on him let's take a few more minutes and in his presence let's just begin to tell him God there's none like you you are my king I come into your chambers and I dance before you and I worship before you because God there's no one like you you are stronger than anyone else you are greater than any circumstance you are stronger than any disease than any problem we may be facing you but I just love to love on God and it is just wonderful to come into his presence and know that he is still a great big God and so many times I think that we we downplay God and and he's my best friend and he's my chum and he's my buddy but he is a powerful God and there's nothing that is too big for him and he is a king and he demands respect and he just is just amazing and he's just so wonderful and it is just awesome to come in and give him all the praise that he deserves because he is bigger than any queen or king that sits on a throne that we could ever imagine my God is bigger than that and if you're facing something tonight let me just encourage you for just a moment that God is bigger than whatever you may be facing he is bigger and stronger and he is a king above all kings 
and that tonight deserves praise. So just for one more second, I just want you to offer up in your own way, just praise to him. God, there is no one like you. We give you praise and we give you glory. And we are thankful that you have met us in this place tonight. Lord, bring life change tonight all over this campus. We give you praise. There is no one like you. In Jesus' name, amen. Why don't you go ahead and cross the aisles and find a friend you haven't seen since Sunday and tell them that God's a great God. Well, happy, happy Wednesday. Have you had a great day? Yeah? Th thank you, Mark. You've had a great day. Woohoo! Glad that you've had a great day. We are glad that you're here tonight. And so, welcome, welcome, welcome to our home, folks. If you are visiting with us tonight, we do want to just welcome you. We hope that most importantly that you have felt the presence of our Heavenly Father and the love that He has to offer to us uh, every time that we just, He wants to do it all the time. Amen. And so we are glad that you're here. And if you are visiting with us for the first time, we do want to encourage you to also join us on Sunday where even more of our faith family is here to just enter into God's presence and just run after God. Amen. We do always have great things happening at faith, so I just want to fill you in on a few things so that you will be in the know. We do have our annual vision casting meeting coming up in two weeks, two weeks from tonight on March 6th. We will be having that event. It will be taking place in the Family Life Center at 7 o'clock p.m. We do want to encourage everyone to be here. What we are going to be doing is looking back over how God blessed us in 2012 and then look forward and plan for the future of how God is going to continue to bless us and continue to just work in our congregation in 2013. So we do want you to be a part on that night. Also, though, on that night, we will be electing a board member or some board members, and so we are in need of some nominations. Those nominations do have to be put in, though, um, the names have to be turned in by next Wednesday. And so if you're interested in making, uh, putting someone's name into that, there are some background stuff that we have to do prior to the meeting. So we do not need that turned in by next Wednesday at the very latest. So that is coming up. And um, also, though, um, the ballots though, are also in the foyer at the information kiosk if you have that. Um, also, though, we do have our upcoming prayer. Remember that we moved our churchwide prayer to the last Thursday of every month, and that is next Thursday. So start marking your calendars now to make plans to be here at 7 o'clock p.m. for our churchwide prayer as we just go after our Heavenly Father and just seek His face because the Bible says that if we humble ourselves and seek our face and seek His face, that, that He will just work and heal our land. And that's what we need. And so just join us as a church family and let's just go after God together. Pastor John. Uh, two things. Um, if you go to the ladies' Bible study in the morning, don't go. It's been canceled. So um, that if, you, if you show up, uh, you'll be by yourself because of the weather. And the second thing is I want to thank everybody that donated uh, canned goods, food, paper products to the pantry. Um, right now the pantry is bursting. And I thank you for that because we have a great need uh, when people come in not only from our church, from, but we have people that come in from the street, and uh, we always give them a bag of food. So thank you all very much. Um, gentlemen, let's worship the Lord tonight with our tithes and offerings. Everybody's looking around. Okay, who's going to do it? Who's going to do it? Yeah. <laughs> our regulars aren't here tonight. <laughs> Father, we thank you. We thank you for your love. We thank you that we can love on you tonight, Lord. And I thank you, Father, for that 
that we worship and praise you and that uh, tonight we did that with our hearts, with our song, our voices, and our hearts. And Lord, I just pray that you'll watch over and protect everyone here. Bless them, Lord, as they give to you in Jesus' name. Good evening. You guys can keep that music going for just a moment. You like the music? Some good choices, right? I see some of you singing along. Yeah? I want you to do me a favor tonight. Why don't you just go ahead and stand. If you are uh, sitting close to the, the back, I would encourage you uh, to come on up and be a part of uh, what's the action that's taking place up in the front areas up here if you want to. We're not making you, but uh, we would love for you to be. Wednesday night is just uh, intimate teaching, and we want to... Uh, kind of create that atmosphere. So why don't you just go ahead and stand. If you'd like to move up, go ahead and do that. If not, uh, find someone else that you did not get to shake their hand a few moments ago and uh, do that again, and we'll get started in just a moment. Amen. Well, thanks for being here tonight. You guys had a great week so far? See some smiling faces. That's a good thing. A little rain. A little rain's good for the soul, right? Good for our land as well. Amen. Let's pray together tonight. Lord, we love you so much. We honor you. We thank you for this incredible privilege that we have to come into this house that we call yours to worship you, Father. We've dedicated this time to you. Uh, just to seek your face, to learn more about who you are through uh, the Song of Songs, and uh, Lord, to explore your goodness to us. And God, I pray that you would bless every individual, every family that's represented in this room tonight, God. I pray that uh, we would truly sense and see how you want to work and move in us and through us, God. I pray that you would anoint the remainder of this service. God, that you would anoint this teaching tonight, Father. May it sink deep onto good, fertile soil. And God, I just thank you for who you are. Thank you, Lord, that we have the, the privilege to be a part of what you're doing in these last days. Thank you, God, for the opportunity to be used in this community to share the good news of Jesus Christ. Lord, each week, people are coming to know you, and we give you praise for that. We thank you for that. We thank you, Lord, for the growth that we've seen in our church family. We thank you, God, that, that people are being discipled, people are being equipped, they're getting into the life flow here at Faith Assembly. And God, we just honor you and we praise you. We ask you that you would continue to use us. Lord, may we be sensitive to the leading and guiding of the Holy Spirit as we do everything we can do to honor you, to bring glory to you. And it's in Christ's name we pray. And everyone said? Amen. Amen. If you're watching online tonight, uh, we do welcome you. I believe that uh, Pastor Jason is actually, uh, he's in another country currently, but uh, he said he was going to be streaming in tonight. So if you're watching this, welcome Pastor Jason. You can click on the top. And uh, you can download your notes up there if, uh, you're av if it's available to you. It is available to you, but if you can. Uh, but I just want to say welcome. We started a, a, a new teaching last week, the Song of Songs. And um, I want to ask you a very serious question tonight. If you are married, how many people is married in the house tonight? Whoop, whoop, come on. Don't be ashamed of it. Are you married? Raise your hand high. Raise it, raise it high. You should be proud to be married to your spouse if you are married, have you enjoyed the fruits of your marital labor this week? You're like, what? That's right. We're talking about raisin cakes, all right? 
Now tonight you may leave this place as 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 uh, Uncle Sai says on Duck Dynasty. Hey, 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 right? That's hey. You just got to ask the question because we are diving straight into the Song of Songs, and it's a very it's a very good book. One of the things that um, that you can be certain of is that we practice what we preach. All right. Are you guys with me tonight? Amen. You're going to leave here tonight, and uh, you may have a sunburn on your face because we are jumping straight into the Song of Psalms. You may be a little red, and the tan is free, so take it, enjoy it. Um, I would like to just kind of throw out a disclaimer, though. The teaching is, uh, most of the time, our teachings are kind of rated G. Uh, tonight is a little bit risque, you could say, because we're, we're in the love book. We're talking about... Uh, Solomon. We're talking about the uh, Shulamite woman and how that God expresses his love through them and they enjoy life together and through intimacy. So tonight's teaching is PG-13 to a little bit of our status. So just want to kind of let you know about that before uh, we get started. There's two different ways that this book of Song of Songs, or also known as Song of Solomon, can be taught. It can be taught as an allegorical uh, from an allegorical perception, which is the relationship of God to his church or the relationship of God to Israel, or it could also be taught contextually, and that's how we're taking the approach. Contextually is the relationship between a man and a woman and how, how, how the intimacy plays out in this, this story and in this book, and that's the approach that we're taking its head on because we believe that the Bible has much to say about our bodies, the functions of our bodies, and how God designed us and how he created us to live and how he created us to enjoy life. So how does God feel about sex? How does God feel about sex? Does everyone have a handout tonight? You have your notes? If not, raise your hand and we'll get one of those to you um, momentarily. Anyone else? Okay, we'll get those to When David comes back in, if we could have someone bring uh, some notes up here, that would be wonderful. Thank you so much for your help. You see, God created us, and he wired us to crave and to want friendships and companionship. It's meant to be that way. He created us to, to be attracted to one another through communion, through conversation, to, to, to relate to one another through uh, the daily things that, that take place in our life. He designed us that way to interact, to have relationships, and to talk with one another. He also designed us to have companionship with our spouses. You see, God didn't just create us to, uh, to live in a cave. We're not cavemen or women. He created us to, to and wired us that we may have relationship with one another. Last week, we were introduced to a, a man and a woman and they love the Lord. We read about that in Song of Songs. We read how they went through this process of being attracted to one another physically and being drawn to one another and how they got to know each other uh, through their relationship. And their relationship began to blossom. It began to grow socially. They kept everything above board in their, their phys the physical aspect of their relationship. Everything was on the table. Men, last week we, we examined and we saw how that what makes you attractive is your name. What makes you attractive is your name. I believe that's your first fill in on your, your sheet. It's not the car that you drive. It's not the body that God allows you to have. It's not the hair that you have or that you don't have. It's not how you look in a mirror. It's not, it's not the money that you have in your banking account. That's not what makes you attractive. What makes you attractive is your name, the integrity that follows after your heart, through your name. When someone says the name Ray Rice, I would hope that, that immediately good thoughts would come to their mind about the integrity and the character of who that person is. That's me. You are attracted because of your, your heart. You're attracted because of the heart that you have within you. God has allowed you to have and that heart needs to beat for him. He designed and he desires you to have that intimate relationship with him. And through that, your character, your integrity, it's built. That's what makes you attractive, men. It's your name. 
following after the integrity of God. Your character is built. It's your name that makes you attractive. Women, what makes you attractive is your submissiveness and respect. Your submissiveness and your respect. It's not how you look. It's not if you're big or if you're small. It's not how you view yourself at, when you look into a mirror. It's not the clothes that you wear. It's not how you wear your hair, if it's colored or if it's not colored. It's not the cosmetic surgeries that are so readily available to us today to enhance your physical features. What makes you attractive is your submissiveness and your respect. When you could come alongside the one that you love, when you could come alongside, I didn't say be stomped or suppressed by, but I said when you could come alongside the one that you love, the one that you love following after God, with the heart of integrity, and you could submit to that leading, that guiding, that protection that he's there for. That's what makes you attractive. It's when you're submissive and you respect. You with me tonight? You should be better because of the one that you love. I believe this is on your sheet. Without guilt, compromise, or regret, you should be able to look the other person, your parents, and everyone else in the eyes and say, I'm stronger, happier, and more pure because more pure than I am ever before. Remember, let's jump back into our story here and pick up where we left off last weekend in Song of Song. Remember that they were doing so well. Their relationship was going great. They, they were physically attracted to one another. They became emotionally attached to one another. Their physical a relationship was above board, above reproach. They didn't go there. And then we come up on chapter 2. If you have our Bibles, turn there. Chapter 2, starting with verse 6. We're going to jump straight into this. If you don't have it, your, uh, your Bible tonight, it's going to be on the screen. Chapter 2, verse 6 says, His left arm is under my head, and his right arm embraces me. What does this mean? What does this mean? His left arm is under my head and his right arm embraces me. What does this mean? She's ready. She's ready for raisin cakes, okay? Say, she's ready for raisin cakes. You got to have a little, little participation here tonight. She is ready for raisin cakes, but what does the man's response say in verse 7? It says, daughters of Jerusalem, I charge you by the gazelles and by the does of, does of the field. Do not arouse or awaken love until it's so desires. Solomon says, it's good, it's right, it's normal, but guess what? It's not time. We are going to treat this like it's, it's something bad. We're just not going to awaken love until the proper time. How many of you in here are single tonight? Don't be ashamed. Come on, raise your hand. You're single. Raise it high, raise it high, raise it high, raise it high. You're single. We have several single people in the house tonight. Can we put our hands together for them? You guys are incredible. Got to ask you a question. You don't have to answer any of these out loud. You can just answer them in your head. Do you ever want to have sex? Do you have a drive and passion for someone you like and you want them in the worst way? See, everybody's turning red tonight. You guys look so good in the sun. Good. You're normal. If that's, that, if that's within you, you're normal. That's a good thing. But I challenge you. I challenge you. Do not awaken love. Until it's time. Do not awaken love until it's time. Do you notice who leads this decision in Scripture? It's the man. It's the man. It's not the woman. He says, he says it's, it's good, but it's just not time. He says, let's not arouse and awaken love until the proper time has come. Men, I charge you, if you're single, lead the way. Be pure in your thoughts and your actions. Lead the way with that person that you're growing intimate with in your relationship. Uh, keep everything above board and lead the way, men. And this book, or this book rather, is about passion and purity. That's, a, that's one of your feelings. It's about passion and it's about purity. Solomon knows that, that she really, really wants him bad, but he's willing to, he's not willing to defy or to lessen the true moment that awaits the two of them in this process. Listen to what it says in verse 8. It says, listen, 
my beloved. Look, here comes leaping across the mountains, bounding over the hills. My beloved is like a gazelle or a young stag. Look, there he stands behind a wall, gazing through the windows, peering through the lattice. What does this sound like? It sounds like, just call it what it is, they're in heat. Okay, they're in heat, they're in heat. What time of the year is this? If you, if you read the scripture, if you read through uh, Song of Songs and, and, and you, you notice that, it, especially in verses 8 through 13, it's a description of what? Springtime. It's, a, it's a, a description of springtime throughout this book, their bodies and their relationships are described also as a vineyard, as they're, they're coming alive, they're coming uh, to their senses, they're growing in their, their, their physical feelings for one another. It's like a vineyard that's coming to life, that's blossoming. It's natural, a gazelle and a young stag, their vineyard is coming to life and they're excited for each other. They're ready. They're going through this courtship process and they're ready. They're ready for the wedding. They're ready for the honeymoon now, but it's not time yet. Chapter two through, two, uh, through three, what's growing? If you read this, these chapters, I encourage you to read Song of Solomon in detail. If you read these chapters, what's growing is passion within them. There's a passion that's growing within them for one another. Biblically, how does the Bible see sexual intimacy? Is it normal, abnormal? Is it good? Is it bad? How does the Bible see sexual intimacy? Somebody give me an answer. It's good. It's more than good. It's incredible. It's more than incredible. It's awesome. It's, it's one of the best things this side of heaven. It's very good in the proper context of marriage. Chapter 3. We're going to zoom through some of this. Chapter 3, starting with verse 6 through 11. This is the, the, the wedding process that's taken place for Solomon and the Shulamite woman. It says, who is this coming from the wilderness like a column of smoke, perfumed with myrrh and incense, made from all the spices of the merchant? Look, it's Solomon's carriage, es escorted by 60 warriors and the noblest of Israel, all of them wearing swords and experienced in battle, each with his sword at his side prepared for the terrors of the night. King Solomon made for him the, the carriage. He made it from wood of Lebanon. Its post he made of silver, its base, its base of gold. Its seat was upholstered with purple, its interior inlaid with love. Daughters of Israel, come out and look. Your daughters of Zion, look on King Solomon wearing a crown, the crown with which his mother crowns him on the day of his wedding, the day his heart rejoiced. So this is the wedding day. He comes for his bride, and they haven't, laid a hand on each other. They have not touched one another in any, any way. They have grown together spiritually, emotionally, and socially, but they haven't laid a single glove on one another. And then we get to chapter 4. The wedding takes place, so guess what? It's the honeymoon. Absolutely. How many of you guys have ever been on a honeymoon? Come on, don't be embarrassed. Raise your hand if you're married. If you're married and you haven't been on a honeymoon, guess what? It's not too late. Plan it. Take your wife on a special special trip and call it your honeymoon. So chapter 4 begins the honeymoon period. This man starts, and I'm going to let you read this at home. I want you to go read this in detail because this is very cool. This is good. This is good stuff. The man starts at the top of the woman's head and goes right down her body. And what's he do? He talks the entire time. What's the most exciting thing to a woman's sexuality? It's a talking, sensitive man who exalts her, who lifts her up, who tells her how wonderful she really is. Men, I encourage you to be a good exalter of your wife. If you're married, lift her up. Speak, speak into her life. Speak beauty to her. Tell her how beautiful she truly is. Be sensitive to her every need. If you ask a woman what sexuality, sexuality is to them, 
They will translate it the same way. One word, tenderness. It's tenderness. Men, be, have a tender spirit in heart and hand towards the one that you love the most. If you say to a man, what's sexuality to them? He'll respond, responsiveness. Responsiveness, which means you want me, don't you? Come on, men, that's the truth, right? We like responsiveness from our spouses. We are not all the same. That's why if, if a woman had a man's sex drive, it would be like two Tasmanian devils going at it all the time. That's the truth, and you know it. If a man had a woman's sex drive, marriage would be this great, long, drawn-out conversation that just lasted forever and ever and ever. That's the way it works. For a man, or for a woman to be a great lover, she must be giving. And for a man to be a great lover, he must be tender. Men, I encourage you, and I challenge you, once again, be tender to the one that you love most, your spouse. That's the honeymoon portion and period of, of Solomon and the Shulamite woman in Scripture of Song of Songs. I encourage you to read that, but I want to kind of switch gears and get into a little bit more practical teaching for us tonight, and that's the intimacy of the marriage. If you are here and you're not married, this is still for you. This is, this is something that you could, you could put into the bank and you could take and you could... And I promise you, one day you'll be able to withdraw on that deposit that you've made, and it'll be something that's wonderful. This is going to be good for all of us. I want to take a perspective from uh, the Apostle Paul and what he says about intimacy in the marriage and how Christ feels about that through that. First uh, Corinthians chapter 7, verses 1 through 7. This is from the message. I chose this translation uh, because it's, it's, it speaks very clearly to us. It says, Now... Getting down to the question that you ask me, that your le- now getting down to the questions you ask in your letter to me. First, so the Corinth, the Corinth church wrote Paul a letter, and this is what he's addressing. First, it is a good thing to have sexual relations. First, is it a good thing to have sexual relations? Certainly, but only within a certain context. It's good for a man to have a wife and for a a woman to have a husband. Sexual drives are strong, but marriage is strong enough to contain them and to provide for a balanced and fulfilling sexual life in a world of sexual disorder. The marriage bed must be a place of mutuality. The husband seeks to satisfy his wife, and the wife seeks to satisfy her husband. Marriage is not a place to stand up for your rights. Marriage is a decision to serve the other, whether in bed or out. Abstaining from sex is permissible for a period of time if you both agree to it, and if it's for the purpose of prayer and fasting, but only for such times. Then come back together again. Satan has an ingenious way of tempting us when we least expect it. I'm not understanding or commanding these periods of abstinence, only providing my best counsel if you should choose them. Sometimes I wished everyone were single like me, a simpler life in many ways. But celibacy is not for everyone any any more than marriage is. God gives the gift of single life to some and the gift of married life to others. The words of of Paul here may not sound like the greatest promotion of marriage. Even in other translations, when you read it, it even seems more uh, questionable. But Paul is merely resigning. He's not as if Paul is merely resigning marriage uh, as a necessity for those who can't control themselves. Paul is certainly, he has his reasons, and there's benefits certainly in in living a life of, of celibacy. But we need to understand that he is, he is beginning to address, in the, through this letter, he's beginning to address these particular people that have come, that have given their heart. They've heard of the good news of the gospel. And you've got to understand, they're living in a part in an area of ancient Greece that 
They're surrounded with all of these different philosophies and understanding of the day of sexuality. It's corrupt, it's wicked, it's, it's, it's obstructed, it's, it's wild, it's literally crazy. So they wrote to Paul, Paul for wisdom, and they asked, is it good, is it a good thing to have sexual relations in the context of marriage? And to really understand this question, we need to remember the philosophy that was uh, prevail, pervading the, uh, the culture in this time. It was a philosophy of dualism. Dualism, which simply, it, it was a complete separation of the marital and the spiritual. And out of this false separation, some could uh, come to conclude that you can do anything with your bodies that you want. Some people thought that you can do anything with your bodies that you want, and others found that this dualistic thinking, a more ascetic approach to life, is that they would detach themselves in their sexuality. So it was one thing all in or the other all in. And this included the married people in this time, and, and they, they had this thinking of this, this philosophy, and, and they were thinking, wow, what do I do with this? What do I do with this? Is this a good thing for me, or is it unfitting for my spiritual life now that I know the good news in the gospel of Jesus? You see, the truth is that our feelings, our feelings today about sex include sexual intimacy in marriage are often still caught between suppression and obsession. Think about it. Oftentimes, many people deal through, through life with the feelings of, with their sexual intimacy with their partner, it's either suppression or obsession. Paul reminds us that neither the indulgent nor the inhabited are seen clearly. I came across this quote by Rob Bell. It's, it's an incredible quote that speaks volumes to this, this teaching. It says, when we deny the spiritual dimension to our existence, when we deny the spiritual dimension to our existence, we end up living like animals. And when we deny the physical sexual dimensions to our existence, we end up living like angels. And both ways are destructive because God made us human. In this passage, Paul, <clears throat> excuse me, he's primarily confronting those who have withdrawn from physical intimacy in their marriage. He's not giving words of, of uh, resignation, but affirmation that the, this is a good thing. This is a good thing. Physical intimacy in your marriage, it's a good thing. So in light of all of this, in light of this, what does God say about physical intimacy? What is God's heart for physical intimacy in your marriage? Where does his heart lie on this matter? There's three different things we're going to cover quickly. Someone give me a time, Pastor John. Three different things. First, physical intimacy in marriage is, write it in, it's good. Everybody say good. Physical intimacy in marriage, it's good. And oftentimes, friends, we have this tendency to view sexuality, sexual expressions, intimacy as a negative thing. Think about this. Oftentimes, we have... These thoughts, when we, when we think about sexuality or sexual intimacy, a negative connotation comes to our mind. It seems that the only time that we ever talk about or address the acts of, of sexual intimacy, it's done in light of a, a, an adultery. It's, it's, it's done in light of someone who's, who's, who's failed, who's fallen short of the mark. It's the only time that we really bring light onto the situation of intimacy in our life as opposed to recognizing the good side of it and the good that God intended it to be in our lives. Friends, I think that we must be, we must be vigilant, extremely vig vigilant in teaching our children about God's plan for sexual intimacy in our lives, in the proper timing. When that time comes, when you have to sit down with your daughter or your, your son and teach them about the birds and bees, we need to be extremely vigilant in doing that. 
Don't let that be an uncomfortable situation for you. As, as, as hard as that is, that cannot slip through the cracks of your parentship. You have to be the one leading the way. I sit on a committee, um, or I'm actively involved in a committee recently called the SHAC Committee. It's a student health advisory committee for a Cy Fair Independent School District. And it breaks my heart, and I get very passionate about this, because in this, this committee, what they do is they, they regulate the, uh, the curriculum that goes into our school systems in the Cy Fair School District, from the physical education aspect of it all the way up through uh, the reproductive units that are taught through physical edu- or sexual education. And some of the things that are trying to be pushed through our system right now, it riches and it breaks my heart. This past, um, this past, I believe it was in the fall, uh, some of you may know about this, but um, <clears throat> there was a, a, a specific curriculum that was trying to be pushed through uh, the system called It's Your Game. And It's Your Game is, a, is an explicit sexual content-driven unit that I would not want anybody to see. No children. It's disgusting. The things that were in that was just heart rich, and I'm like, how in the world can we can we lower ourselves to this standard? Friends, we have to teach our kids the proper way, God's plan of sexual intimacy in a marriage. We have to be the ones who lead that charge. So I encourage you. I've said that I'm getting very passionate about it. Pray for me, because I've actually just been, as of yesterday, selected to serve on a subcommittee that has to to spend lots of hours researching and coming up with a curriculum that's going to affect over 125,000 students in Sci Fair. So I encourage you to, to pray for me, and also I encourage you and challenge you to invest in your kids. Let's teach our kids about sex in a way that when they grow up and they find that person that they will become one with, they won't deal with guilt or shame. They won't see it as a negative thing. Because they've always been taught that sex is bad. I think too, for far too long, I know in, in, in my generation growing up, we were taught sex is bad, don't do it. Well, I understand it's bad if you're a teenager or if you're not ready for it, if you're not ready for it to, to come alive in your life, as in Solomon's life here. But we have to teach it in such a, a, a way that it brings glory to God because it's a great thing. It's a great gift. Our children need to understand that this is like a Christmas present. It's yours. It's there. It's in the box. You just can't unwrap it until the time is right. And then it's fully yours. You could, you could explore it. You could have it. You could enjoy it for the rest of your life. Does that make sense? I want us to, to be very vigilant in teaching our children that it's not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing because for Far too long, I've, dealt, I've seen people deal with, they get into a relationship and they get married and then all of a sudden they have intimacy problems because they've been taught all their life, it's bad, it's bad, you shouldn't be doing that, it's not right. Let's teach our children the proper plan that God has for their life, that it's the best thing in life for them in the proper timing. As I said earlier, sex is the best thing this side of heaven when it's explored in the proper context of marriage. Foundations of our sexual sexuality are found in Scripture. Let's cruise through this. Genesis chapter 1, verse 27 says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Chapter 2, verses 24 and 25 says, For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and will be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. The man and his wife were both naked and felt no shame. You see, here we have the foundations of this dynamic union. It's a picture of of two complete but complementary beings coming together in a partnership. In one entity, in reality, becoming one entity together. The scripture says that they, that the man was to leave and to be united. Some, some uh, translations say to cleave to and to become one flesh, joining in a physical and sexual, with sexual intimacy. We find that the goodness of this is in the union itself. 
It's in the union itself. It's a lifelong new entity that, that's been created, which we call marriage. The scripture says that both of them, uh, both of them were naked and they felt no shame. It's a shameless union between a man and a woman. They could be physically naked with each other because they were exposed to one another in heart and in soul as well. You see, despite all of our culture wants to, to believe, research continues to prove and continues to reveal and show us that the most satisfying sexual relationships are those of lifelong monogamous married relationships between a man and a woman. God says of such union as with everything that he created in, in, in this world, it's, he says, it's good. It's very good. Physical intimacy, and I believe this is a feeling, physical intimacy is not the catalyst of marriage. Physical intimacy is not the catalyst of marriage, but rather the culmination, but rather the culmination and in this sense, is to be celebrated and cherished. See, friends, everyone who is married, as well as desires to be married, needs to recognize that our physical intimacy is a wonderful, sacred, and it's a good thing. The second thing about intimacy in the marriage is physical intimacy in marriage is meant to satisfy natural and sensual desires. Physical intimacy in marriage is meant to satisfy the natural and the sensual desires in marriage. It's to be pleasure. It's to be something that you enjoy. As a Christ follower who really values our spiritual uh, nature, we may not be comfortable acknowledging that physical intimacy is good, but perhaps a bit awkward with thinking God really intended such pleasure. In this, in this very beautiful fashion, God's word celebrates sensual dimension, dimension of physical intimacy in marriage. He celebrates that. Paul not only affirms, but even calls for both, the scripture says, for the husband and the wife to what? Satisfy one another. That's what we just read in Scripture. Yes, sex is a sacred means for being co-creators of life, but there is a, a dimension of pleasure, of satisfying the natural, sensual desires that you have as human flesh. Let's look at the language by which the sexual intimacy is celebrated in God's Word. In Proverbs chapter 5, verses 18 through 19, it says this, May your fountain be blessed, and may you rejoice in the wife of your youth. A loving doe, a graceful deer, may her breasts satisfy you always. May you ever be captivated by her love. The Song of Solomon, or Song of Songs, in chapter 5, verses 10 through 16, says this. And the description of this is, it's a, it's a great gift, but this could almost, almost be embarrassing reading it. But it says... My lover is radiant and ruddy, outstanding among 10,000. His head is pure as gold. His hair is wavy and black as a raven. His eyes are like doves by the water stream, washed in milk, mounted like jewels. His cheeks are like beds of spice, yielding perfume. His lips are like lilies, dripping with myrrh. His arms are rods of gold with, set with, help me out here. What's this version say? Topaz, okay. It's not what it says here. We'll go with topaz. His body is like polished ivory decorated with sapphires. His legs are pillars of marble set on bases of pure gold. His appearance is like Lebanon, choice as its cedars. His mouth is sweetness itself. He is altogether lovely. This is my lover. This is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. His response in, in 6 through 9 says, How beautiful you are and how pleasing, O love, with your delights. Your stature is like that of the palm and your breasts like clusters of fruit. I said, I will climb the palm tree. I will take hold of its fruits. May your breasts be like clusters of the vine, the fragrance of your breath like apples. 
and your mouth like the breast, the best wine. May the wine go straight to the lover, flowing gently over lips and teeth. Isn't that cool? Isn't that sensual? If you are married, that's a good thing. That's a great thing. See, though these, these images are almost, they're funny. They're very funny to, to read and to think about. They're very distant from our culture and how we communicate in the, the terminology that, that we use nowadays. It's, it's a beautiful expression of, of sensual pleasure found in physical intimacy in a marriage, God's way. It's a celebration of sensuality that doesn't reduce the other person to an object, but rather observes the other and appreciates the other's body. Song of Songs shows that marital sex is to be erotic and personal. I believe that's a fill-in if I'm not mistaken. Erotic and personal, romantic and fun, passionate and patient. What does the Bible say about physical intimacy? The third thing, physical intimacy in marriage is meant to be mutual. Write that down. Mutual. The key to physical intimacy is mutuality. It's the unselfish giving of yourself. You see, through marriage, we become, we become one entity. We become one in flesh before God, in which our, our lives are, are not our own. And at that point, our bodies are not our own as well. Paul is not encouraging some sort of obligation that leads itself to uh, a, a place of being used or abused by someone, but it's, it's, he leads us to a place of mutuality where consent is given on both parts in this process. You see, a married couple should not use, this is very, very, very important. A married couple should not use, they should not use the withholding of physical intimacy as a weapon against their spouse. If you get nothing else tonight and you're married, get that. You should not use the withholding of sexual, physical intimacy against your spouse. Paul says that if you're doing this, you're making yourselves vulnerable to temptations. You're making yourself vulnerable to temptations of the enemy to find sexual intimacy, physical intimacy outside of the bonds of marriage. Guard yourself. He goes on to say in Scripture there that we read that such pleasure is not to be restrained unless it's mutually consented for the purpose of prayer and fasting and only for a short while. And all the men's smiling tonight. They're like, yeah, it's mutual. Don't withhold. <clears throat> you see, as God's gift to the intimacy between husband and wife, physical intimacy should be valued and enjoyed on a regular basis. It's, the great, it's one of the greatest gifts that God gave mankind is coming together in one entity, sharing the expression, sharing the heart, sharing the soul, sharing your physical body with someone else. What greater gift is that this side of heaven? That's a cool one. In conclusion, we're going to take a U-turn here. Your minds are, have been filled with terminology tonight, a lot about physical intimacy, sensual, sexual desires, sex. You've heard all these things. You've probably heard none of that. You probably haven't heard these words in a long time. I encourage you, go home and talk to your wife about this. Talk to your husband about it. I want to read a story in closing that will tie this all together. Harley Sheffield gained celebrity status through an unusual mishap. He was part of a 15,000-mile relay carrying the Olympic torch to the, with, to the 100th gathering of the games in Atlanta. His job and his section of the relay went over the Tacoma Narrows Bridge in Washington on May the 7th of 1996. And while carrying this flame made on a special stand for his bike, the rear tire, it blew out 
and Sheffield lost control of his bike and the Olympic torch went out. All those people gasped that were watching in disbelief that the, the Olympic torch had went out. It had traveled 15,000 miles and now it's out. But the attenders to the torch knew exactly what to do. They simply reached into the van that accompanied the traveling torch. They pulled out a new torch and they lit it from the mother flame that was in the van, which always stayed lit in the van. What happened on this Washington Bridge often happens at times in our journey of life. Oftentimes this happens in our journey of life. You're cruising along in this journey and you stumble and the flame of your spiritual zeal is doused. It's doused. And you stare at the extinguished torch in your life and you wonder if you could ever again burn with spiritual passion ever again. But when we return to, to God in repentance, we quickly realize that his Holy Spirit is always there. He's the mother torch in our life. He's always there. He can never go out and he rekindles us. He re, he. He relights us because we've come and have repent with a repentant heart and we can once again be reunited and carry on in our journey that God has called us on. You see, friends, if you're married, if you're married, the only way to have the intimate relationship with your spouse that God intends is to have his flame burning in your life. The only way to have the, the intimate relationship that God desires you to have in your life through your marriage is to have his flame burning in your life. I challenge you to live a life that is pure and holy before God and your spouse. That's my challenge to you tonight, to live a, a life that's pure and holy before God and your spouse, to guard that very sacred covenant that you came into with, with God and your spouse, to guard that with all of your heart. If your flame of passion and intimacy has been doused, I challenge you to dig deep inside of you and to flame the very embers of love that you have for your spouse. Make the adjustments and enjoy God's wonderful gift, living once again in one entity. If you're single, if you're engaged, and you hope one day to grow in love, I don't think you fall in love. I believe that you grow in love. If, you, if one day you want to, to grow in, in love and become one entity with your spouse according to to God's plan, I challenge you, I challenge you, hold high the torch of purity. I challenge you to, to make deposits into the process that God has for your life and that one day when you grow in love, when you meet that person that you are to marry, you become one entity, you will be able to draw on a lifetime of pleasure because you've made the deposits. And it's not backed by the FDIC, but it's backed by God himself the creator of the heavens and the universe, the creator, the one who formed you in your mother's womb. That's my challenge for us tonight. Can we pray? Lord, I just thank you for who you are. God, I thank you that your plan for, for our lives, Father, is a good plan. Lord, I thank you that you created man and woman, God, and we're complete, but we complement one another. Lord, that was your plan from the very beginning of time that we may live a life that's open, that's shameless, in unity with one another. Father, I thank you for the processes that you have in place for our lives, the processes of, of dating, the processes of courtship, the processes, Lord God, that you have, that we could come together in unity through marriage, through a covenant before your holy name. And God, that we could experience and express life with one another on this journey, journey becoming one ent entity. God, I just ask you, Father, tonight that you would touch every person that's here. 
Lord, if, 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 they're, if they're a married couple, I pray, God, that you would just, that you would stir them up, that you would challenge them, help them to see, God, that this goes far beyond uh, a sexual relationship. God, open our eyes up that, that it's, it's far beyond just the physical attraction that we have for one another, although that is good. But God, it's much deeper than that. It's living in accord with you, with your flame burning in our lives as the center. God, I pray for every single person that's in this place tonight. God, I thank you for them. God, I pray if, if, their, if their flame of, of purity has been doused, God, restore them tonight. Restore them tonight. May they come before you and may you restore them and may they live under the covering of the purity that you have for them for this day forth until they meet and unite with that one that you have for them. God, I pray that you bless our homes. God, that you would give us wisdom in making decisions and, and talking with our children about God's plan for their lives in the area of intimacy. God, I pray that you would give us strength, that you would give us wisdom, Father. May we be the teachers that teach them. No one else. They'll hear it from other places, but may we be the ones who impart into them God's plan. The world will try to tell them other things, but God, we need to the wisdom to impart your plan to them. God, I thank you for who you are. I thank you, God, that you have created us incredible beings to enjoy life. And Lord, in the context of marriage, to enjoy one another. It's a beautiful thing in your eyes. God, I pray that you'll bless every person. In Jesus' name. I'm going to encourage you tonight in just a few moments. We'll, we'll spend a few moments in prayer like we do every Wednesday night. If you would like to, to bow where you're at, if you'd like to walk.